Excellent. Um, well, thank you so much for the fantastic introduction. Um, and I will say that, yeah, we have 45 minutes here together. And I've kind of intentionally tried to keep the talk relatively short. So uh, there's plenty of time for kind of a more of a conversation around these things, because I have some ideas that I'm very excited to share with you. But ultimately, I think this is like this kind of brave new frontier where there's a lot of kind of open questions that we don't really know. So hopefully we'll get a chance to chat about that. So um, yeah, I, with that, I think I'm just gonna dive straight in. So I'm gonna start this talk with a, a painting that perhaps many of you are quite familiar with. Um, this is um, Edmond de Boulamy, a painting that sold at a Christie's art auction and in 2018 for $432,000. And the interesting thing about this painting, about uh, this Christie sale, is the fact that um, this artwork was created by an AI and very much leaned into that fact in its selling. And in fact, uh, it actually ended up selling for 40 times its original valuation of $10,000. And it seems like the fact that it was generated by an AI was a critical part in its high valuation. So in this talk, I'm going to use Edmond de Boulamy as a case study to explore some of the interesting questions that arise around authorship and AI and what that can teach us in thinking about artistry in the digital age. So there's two reasons why Edmund de Villami was such a weird case. The first is its kind of interesting origins. As this Verge article states, um, the people who created Edmund de Villami, um, it's an art collective called Obvious out of France, um, they essentially used um, a code base, um, an online public GitHub repo made by a 19-year-old technologist named Robbie Barrett, who posted this code online and Obvious took the code and used it to train the, a model on which to generate um, the outputs and Edmund de Boulamy. The weird part, though, is that when they essentially used the code, it was very much like they just pulled the code and just ran it. And even though the outputs that they got were slightly different than uh, the outputs that uh, Robbie got when he created the, the GitHub repository, um, it's the same process. It's the same algorithm essentially that was using the, uh, this art collective essentially just used minor tweaks um, along the way to kind of generate this. So when Obvious um, kind of sold this artwork, um, there was this kind of open question where should um, Robbie Barrett, the person who created uh, the technology upon which is based, uh, get any of the credit? And Robbie was, I think, a little upset that Obvious completely ignored him, didn't give him any of those $432,000, and ultimately um, kind of took the money for themselves. And it's, it's an interesting question, right? Because ultimately, it was an open source tool. Um, but really, what really did Obvious do other than a kind of trick in marketing a little bit? So this kind of underscores the fact that there's a lot of human actors involved in the production of this complex digital artifact. And it's unclear how all of those kind of fit together to create this um, final output. The other interesting part of the Edmund de Boulamy story is how it was talked about and how it was marketed. From Christie's own material, they said that the portrait is not the product of a human mind. It was created by an artificial intelligence. The, the humans, the obvious, who are doing the kind of manual work of laying it out and hitting run, they're completely removed from the creation process. And instead, the AI is anthropomorphized, endowed with human properties in order to showcase and this kind of new way of creating art. Reuters, said that it was also created by artificial intelligence, endowing that final authorship to the AI. Even USA Today said the painting was completed by artificial intelligence, but here it says it was managed by the Paris-based collective. So here, okay, now there's a distinction between creation of the art and managing the art. That's kind of an interesting distinction. Or finally, NDTV says that the 
AI understood the rules of portraiture, right? So kind of endowing the AI with some anthropomorphic language, right? Understanding um, in some kind of deep way. So what we're seeing here is that the media is piling on this anthropomorphic human-like language to how the, uh, the artwork is talked about. And it seems like potentially this anthropomorphizing of the AI might have been partially responsible for the hype around the piece and ultimately its final price of $400,000. So in this talk, we're gonna grapple two questions. The first is this basic question of who gets credit for AI generated art? If there's all these people, who should it be? And second, does anthropomorphizing it change that allocation of credit? And I'll talk a little bit more about these two questions. So as we mentioned before, there's potentially a lot of um, human actors involved in the complex web of AI. Um, Nick Siever, an anthropologist at uh, Tufts University, um, says that AI is a diffuse socio-technical process. And what that means is that there's basically a lot of human actors and computational processes interacting in this complex network that ultimately results in this um, monolithic concept that we call AI. And oftentimes when we collapse all of those people and processes into a single bucket, we remove the nuance and the sophistication of what's actually happening and maybe even remove the hard work and the labor of many people in that process. So one, for example, is that you might think about operationalizing AI is kind of in this little actor network here, right? Where here, what you have is a technologist in the bottom left who maybe creates a algorithm from scratch. This is, you know, someone writing a um, fancy paper with lots of math in it. And then separately, there's lots of users to a platform. These are maybe the original Renaissance painters who are painting all of the training data that uh, DCG GAN was trained on. Or it might be users of a social media platform who are providing their behavioral data. Then someone else, a practitioner or an artist maybe, um, would actually take the data and the algorithm and train it to create a fully generative model that is capable of producing novel synthetic media. What happens then is that an image or not, uh, something comes in as some input to the system and creates a kind of perspective output of the system. And then there's a final human in the loop here called a curator who basically is looking at the final output of the AI and saying, is this something that we like? Is this something that is kind of interesting going forward? And then finally, there's some kind of impact on the world from the output that has been kind of mediated by the curator. An important psychological and philosophical phenomenon that emerges from actor networks like this is called the moral crumple zone. And what the moral crumple zone refers to is the context where when you have a complex system that gives that basically arises some um, you know violation or some um, you know discrepancy, oftentimes humans look for a human or a particular thing to blame. Uh, and oftentimes it is the person at the very fringes of this um, complex system. So the classic example, right, is if um, you are in the airport, although none of us really are these days, and essentially, um, you know, your plane is delayed or maybe even canceled, you, you always see someone go and yell at the, the flight attendant, the person kind of at the kiosk. And obviously it is not that person's fault whatsoever. It's actually a complex system of all these flights and logistics that led to that flight being canceled, yet our kind of um, very, um, like, you know, the way that our psychology works and assigning blame and assigning credit basically requires some human that we can kind of look at and like blame or assign credit. And so we often do this to these people at the kind of fringes who are at the very kind of edge of the system, maybe like the curator here. So here we're basically going to explore how um, human folk intuitions of morality and of credit um, bring to bear on these kind of complex systems for generation, which have never really been the case. And it seems like our norms for how we think about production and authorship need to catch up to the complexity of the tools we are creating. The second question here is, does anthropomorphizing change who gets credit? And this basically comes from 
a rich uh, strand of literature in uh, psychology, which basically looks at um, the dimensions of mind perception, the extent to which we perceive other minds in the, the, the things around us. So the kind of classic thing, uh, way to quantify this is from the science paper um, in 20, uh, 2008, um, which basically decouples mind perception into two axes here. So you have um, you know, experience here, which is your capacity to kind of um, receive, to, be, to have experiences in the world and to be the recipient of um, you know, various things. And on the other axis, you have agency, which is your capacity to act to exert your influence along the world. And for all these things, for you can plot where should a chimp, a woman, a dog, a fetus, a frog be, how much are they capable of experience and of agency? And here you can kind of see that um, the extent to which a, a being is capable of experience and agency really potentially impacts um, mind perception and thus shapes our moral judgments. And a fun kind of thing to note with this uh, graph here is you can see robot here at the bottom, which is very low experience, but a kind of a marginal amount of agency. And what happens is when you move the agency of the robot higher, you, you get a uh, God in this case. So this is this kind of like a dangerous analogy for what happens when we endow more agency uh, to our technologies. Um, yeah, and then also kind of in the context of self-driving vehicles, people have shown that um, when you anthropomorphize an AI, kind of give it like a, a voice and all these kind of human -like characteristics, people do trust it more. So it does seem like the way we talk about and endow characteristics to our machines really impacts how we um, think about them. So um, we assess these questions through the lens of a uh, um, like computational and quantitative social science. So, and we ran two studies. I'm gonna first talk about our first study design. So what we did is we basically had participants read a vignette about how AI generated art is made. And this is, um, you know, close to a thousand participants recruited through Amazon's Mechanical Turk, which is kind of like crowdsourced labor market that allows us to run survey experiments very kind of flexibly and easily. Um, and so here is the kind of vignette that people read here. And for the sake of time, I won't kind of really uh, read the whole thing, but basically the idea is it kind of follows that actor network we talked about before, where thousands of people all over the world, this is the crowd, are kind of uploading images to some site. We have Timmy, a technologist who creates a image manipulation software called Eliza here. We have an artist who takes the images from the crowd and the technology, the technology from Timmy and basically fully trains this generative model. And then finally, the Casey, who is the curator, who is kind of evaluating um, how that art should be. And I should say that, you know, this vignette, this kind of structural model of how AI art is generated, um, we actually um, curated that by going to lots of kind of AI art conferences and basically talking to experts uh, and people who actually do this and say, okay, how does this kind of work a little bit? And trying to kind of trace something that matches their um, kind of perspectives. And then finally, after they've read this, participants kind of answer questions about how much money and credit each of the actors there should receive, as well as rating the anthropomorphicity of Eliza. So some kind of general results here. First, I'm, what I'm showing you is a just kind of overall histogram a density curve of the overall anthropomorphicity measure that participants had towards ELISA. And what you can kind of just see at first glance here, right, is that there's meaningful variation in the extent to which people perceive that AI is anthropomorphic. Some people were at that two there at the very bottom, a large amount, which thought that the AI was not anthropomorphic at all. They thought of it as a tool, right? Kind of something more like Photoshop almost. And yet for each of those people, there were also people at the far end of the spectrum, right? At the 10 or 12 mark, which thought the AI was this kind of, um, you know, agentic um, being with its own capacity to plan and have intelligence. And it's interesting that just a baseline um, receiving the same vignette um, there was a wide range in perceptions of how anthropomorphic um, the AI was. So we thought that was kind of interesting. What else you can do is look at the allocation of responsibility to the different artists. And what we're gonna do here is basically break up um, for each 
um, you know, actor, we're going to break it up into people who perceived the AI as less than median anthropomorphicity or more than median anthropomorphicity to kind of look at how anthropomorphicity mediates the how people um, should, um, yeah, allocate responsibility. And the results here are kind of what you see here. Um, we're a little underpowered to kind of detect anything with this design, but there's one kind of very clear result here, right, where people who anthropomorphize ELISA itself oftentimes allocate more responsibility to the AI. And when you don't anthropomorphize ELISA, the AI, you do not allocate responsibility to it for the production of AI art like Edmund de Bellamy. So we found that this is quite interesting, but ultimately this is a correlational analysis where we are only looking at how two things kind of co-vary so in order to kind of get at more of the causal mechanisms behind this, we ran a second experiment. But first, the conclusions of this, just to kind of say them again, is that we found this meaningful variation in the extent to which people perceived AI as anthropomorphic, right? So some of the people saw the AI as a tool and other people saw the same exact AI as an agent. And also that this perception of anthropomorphicity was related to the allocation of responsibility, especially for the AI, when people anthropomorphized it more, they rated more responsibility to the AI. So in the second study to kind of really get at the causal mechanisms there, it's the same exact paradigm. We have participants read the vignettes um, and then answer questions about money and credit as well as anthropomorphicity. But here, what we do is instead of give everyone the same vignette, what we do is we actually have two different vignettes where we actually actively manipulate how the AI is discussed in the vignette. In one, we frame the AI as a tool, very much like a Photoshop technology that someone is creating their own art. Um, in the second vignette, um, we use the kind of language that you saw in those news articles above from you know, US News Today and Reuters really kind of hyping up the agentic and kind of autonomy of the AI in the generation process. And there, since we're randomly assigning participants to the AI as tool versus AI as agent condition, we can be sure that any difference that arise in um, the allocation of money and credit is only due to this kind of perceived anthropomorphicity that arises. So, some kind of results here. Again, I'm showing you the actors on the x-axis here and this kind of one through seven, how much responsibility should participants think each of those actors receive. And again, I'm gonna kind of break it up here by condition now, the people who perceive the AI as an agent versus the people who perceive the AI as a tool. And what you see is kind of striking. For the technologist, we see that when the AI is talked about in anthropomorphic language, people think that technologist is more responsible than they were when the AI is just a tool. And conversely, we see that the artist receives less credit when the AI is perceived as an agent, presumably because they are kind of doing less and it's more the kind of AI doing it. So yeah, describing the AI as an agent increases responsibility to the technologist and decreases responsibility to the artist. Um, you can also cut a, a material um, dollar amount on this, right? So here we have a kind of similar graph, but now it's actual how much money, right? If we said you have $432,000, right? This is the exact same as Edmund de Bellamy. How should you split up the money um, among these kind of actors involved in the generation process? You see the same exact pattern where people assign more money to the technologist when you anthropomorphize the AI and less money to the artist. Um, yeah, so that's, that's kind of wild. And just to kind of have some conclusions from that, um, the perceptions of AI um, can actually be manipulated by changing language, right? We were successful in changing the anthropomorphic nature of the AI just by manipulating the language we use to discuss it in these, AI, in these uh, vignettes for the generation process. Um, and in addition, we found that anthropomorphizing uh, the AI can actually materially hurt artists and benefit technologists, right? It really actually matters the words that we use and can have material implications for various actors in the generation process.
So one kind of interesting analogy here that I think is kind of useful is uh, the advent of um, uh, cameras here. And so when you know the, the first kind of camera came about, this is kind of in the early 1800s, um, basically um, a lot of uh, portrait artists were very terrified here, right? So here's um, Paul De La Roche saying, from today, painting is dead at uh, the demo for the uh, daguerreotype in 1939, right? Because if you can kind of perfectly capture and synthesize um, the thing, why do you need a, a portrait artist to kind of capture that? And so people thought this kind of new emerging technology of, um, you know, um, photography basically was going to ruin art and ruin painting and kind of represent this kind of fundamental disruption to the field. Um, however, uh, we've seen history play out in a different way, right? We've realized that oh, instead of being this kind of fundamental disruption to the artistic process that automates, you know, art, artistry in general, instead, we realize that photography is its own artistic medium with its own distinct affordances. And as such, it doesn't have to replace or diminish the act of portraiture. Instead, it's just a new thing that needs to be kind of understood in its own terms. And I think this is a great representation of how we might want to think about AI art going forward um, as a kind of new medium with its own affordances instead of this kind of Terminator hype fear wagon of like, oh man, the AI is just gonna like automate this away. These anthropomorphic things are gonna change this. And I think this is particularly important um, as we kind of think about the future and uh, we think about generative media in a hyper-connected world. We're very quickly approaching a time when um, virtual influencers like Will Michaela are the people that you know are on Instagram who are showing us what we kind of want to believe in. And um, when we have these kind of AI generated, distributed kind of crowd art being the kind of um, you know, inputs that we're receiving from the world, it kind of very radically changes how we think about not only um, you know, how credit and responsibility should be distributed to these kind of things, but also what is art and what is the kind of images that we need to be creating. Um, one, I think, kind of particularly salient example of this is this kind of new flavor of media that's popping up. Um, this is ex exemplified by um, Meet the Ganimals, another one of our projects, and um, Artificial FM, where essentially you have uh, generative media um, for uh, Meet the Ganimals, this is Big Gan, and for AFM, this is um, kind of um, jukebox, so it's kind of like generative music. And what you have is a generator creating new media assets, but you have kind of a crowd of people who are collectively providing feedback. And this could be a like on Instagram, or this could be a more detailed um, feedback. But the idea is that the AI is learning, right? And there's some kind of like reinforcement style adaptation and evolution process of the generative media. And there, there might not even be a human in the loop per se, who's kind of curating this, but instead it's kind of the crowd who is collectively evolving the kinds of media that we interact with. And so this is a very kind of new, interesting and potentially scary kind of way of thinking of uh, digital images, uh, particularly because we don't really know how to think about credit and responsibility for these things. So ultimately um, that's kind of uh, all I have to say. I hope that kind of sparked some conversation but I think the one kind of takeaway that I hope kind of talking about Edmund de Bellamy as this example from 2018 and these kind of like new media that's popping up again is that we need to be aware of the language and how we talk about these technologies. Because when we talk about them for, you know, with these very agentic language, right? Um, Lil Michaela as a being, you know, with their own feelings and emotions or, you know, meet the Ganimals as its own kind of thing that actually fundamentally and materially changes how we and our brains kind of assign um, responsibility and credit to the various actors involved in the production of these media. So as a result, like as technologists, as theorists, as um, citizens and as journalists, we need to be very careful about the narratives we tell and the stories that and the metaphors involved with these things because it ultimately matters. And the, the thing I'll kind of conclude with here is I'm not saying any kind of prescriptive or normative theory of like how we should do this, right? I'm not saying, oh, like 
we should not anthropomorphize them at all because then that removes the credit from the artist. Um, this is ultimately a question for society to kind of figure out as a whole. All I'm kind of talking about here is kind of um, folk perceptions of um, responsibility and how those affect these kind of demonstrating this kind of psychological effect that then we as a society can kind of talk about um, more generally. So with that, uh, thanks so much. I'll kind of open up the floor for um, questions and conversation.